everyone. Today we're going to do our second short video helping to explain the 33 Days to Morning Glory, Consecration to Jesus through Mary. And today we'll be speaking about St. Louis Marie de Montfort's book, True Devotion to Mary. So let's begin with a prayer to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse, amen. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So as you know, those of you who are participating in this study, the book 33 Days to Morning Glory by Father Michael Gately was influenced by True Devotion to Mary that was written by St. Louis de Montfort in the 1700s. And it's a form of consecration to Jesus through Mary by which we perfectly renew our baptismal vows. And um, if you consider our, in our baptism, that in our baptism, we were baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we consecrate ourselves to Jesus through Mary, St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, we're perfectly renewing those vows made in our baptism. And that the cause of so much suffering in our life really is that we don't, we don't keep the vows that were made for us either through our godparents, if we were baptized as infants, or through our own free will, if we were baptized as older persons. But if we would keep those vows, we would be so much filled with joy because every commandment of God is given out of love to lead us to union with him in heaven. So consecrating ourselves to Jesus through Mary, some people um, question like, well, why don't you just go directly to Jesus, because Mary is only a creature. And that's a good question. But if you think about it, it's God himself who gave us the model, because he came to us through Mary. And so he invites us to return to him through Mary, because she is, although she's only a human person, she's immaculate. And so it's like he gave us a vessel with which we could receive the immense treasure that he wants to give us. And without her capacity, we're very limited in our ability to receive the divine. So when we made our baptismal vows, we renounced Satan and all his pomps and works, and we professed our belief in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So every time we sin, we're turning away from those vows that are meant to lead us to happiness. Now, because Mary's the Immaculate Conception and she never sinned, the devil has no power at all over her. That's why oftentimes when you see a picture or a statue of Mary, you see a serpent under her feet. And that's a reference back to Genesis 3.15, which is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, because it was the first promise of the Redeemer. And um, in the original language, it's, a, it's difficult to identify the gender of the pronoun. So it's, it's, it's uh, interpreted in different ways um, as he or she. But the reason that down through the centuries, Our Lady's picture with the serpent under her feet is because one of the more ancient translations was God speaking to the serpent said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She shall crush your head, and you shall lie in wait for her heel. So Our, Our Lady is given the authority over Satan as the new Eve, because if you think about it, it was the first Eve who, by listening to Satan, brought sin, death, suffering, every anguish into the world. And so Our Blessed Mother, being the new Eve, is sent to reverse that. So when we consecrate ourselves to her, we, we can live our baptismal vows more faithfully because she allows us to share in her own love and in her own capacity. St. Louis de Montfort, um, he said that we should entrust to Our Lady all of our possessions and all of the merits of our good actions, past, present, and future for her to apply to souls according to God's will. Now, some people hesitate there, as um, Father Michael Gately pointed out, because they think, you know, if I give all my, all my merits to our Blessed Mother, 
you know, what about my own family and friends, you know, like, what about those people I'm so praying for that they'll um, be able to follow God into the kingdom of heaven. And um, he said, that's really kind of a, a selfish thought because Our Lady doesn't ever, she's not out, just like God is not outdone in generosity, neither is our blessed mother. Because whatever we give to her, it, it doesn't become less, it becomes more. And so she's not going to um, neglect our relatives and friends just because we've consecrated ourselves to her totally. In fact, it's a reassurance. To me, it was such a reassurance when I made this consecration because um, like I never really knew if I was praying enough for people that I love, you know, and, and now I know that all my prayers are just going to her and she's distributing them according as each person has the need, which she sees with much more clarity than I do. And uh, the other thing to think about is, you know, we really don't have that great merits. You know, we might think, oh, you know, I've done all this and that, but really we're all sinners, you know? And so what we have to offer to God is like not much. But, but the happy thing is that, that he gives us a, an ability to have, have a person to entrust our talents to, and that's our blessed mother. So if you think about the parable of the talents, when, um, when the one man, first, the first man um, received five talents and he gained five more, the second two talents and he gained two more, and then the third received only one talent, but he buried it. You know, and we all um, have a tendency, I think, to do that because at Medjugorje, Our Lady said, each person has their own unique gift. And we sometimes, we don't want to manifest that gift for whatever reason, but but the other thing that she'll do is she'll help us to be able to discern what our gift is and also to share it with the people, all the people around us. And she's the treasurer of God because Jesus was entrusted to her. If you think about it, um, the incarnate word of God, the second person of the Trinity um, took on human nature through her. So whatever we entrust to her becomes immeasurably more beautiful and enhanced. Um, because she represents the whole church and her individual person. And when we look at Our Lady, we see what God's intention is for the whole church. And which um, St. Paul tells us that we are being built into a dwelling place for God in the spirit. She already is completely and, uh, and immaculately that dwelling place for God in the spirit. And as we prepare for Pentecost Sunday, this coming Sunday, there's no greater person to unite with um, no human person, I shouldn't say, because um, certainly Jesus is greater than Mary because Jesus is a divine person. But, but to unite with our blessed mother Mary to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, that she would draw the Holy Spirit into our souls. And uh, the more we do that, the more we're going to experience the great joy that the apostles have experienced at the first Pentecost. When you think about it, um, they were so joyful that people thought they were drunk. They were like, you know, they must have been shouting and dancing. I mean, because Peter begins his sermon by saying, you know, they're not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. So, so I think sometimes we just follow God and we think, oh, you know, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do this and that. But, and we think it's not going to be, you know, it's going to be like boring and humdrum, but that's not God. God is joy. God is love. And we were created for him. And we were created to know him, love him, serve him, and be happy with him forever in heaven. So the more we follow God, the happier we're going to be. It's just the opposite of, um, I think, what many people in the world think, that it's just, you know, oh, no, following God is boring. Not so. Not so. You, you never know what adventure the Lord is going to lead you on next. Um, so St. Louis de Montfort, a quote that Father Michael Gately also quotes in his book, we make more progress in a brief period of submission to and dependence on Mary than in whole years of following our own will and relying upon ourselves. You know, and sometimes we think, um, you know, we make all these plans, like I'm going to do this and that for the Lord. And, you know, and then we do all these works and so forth. And then, I mean, I'm talking about myself, you know, and then, then we say, well, I hope that was what you wanted, Lord. You know, but I don't know because I didn't take the time to ask. I didn't take the time to say, Holy Spirit, is this what you want me to do? You know, and so if we're, if we're really living our consecration to Jesus through Mary, then we're going to be 
more humble and we're going to be able to hear her guidance and the guidance of the Holy Spirit with more clarity and we won't be so distracted and self-sufficient, which is the things that lead us to um, unhappiness is our self-sufficiency. That's why Jesus said, unless you turn and become like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven because little children are dependent and um, they understand their littleness, but we often forget it. So this is another advantage of this consecration. Um, now, I want you to think about the parallel between the Annunciation and Pentecost, because it's an important parallel. At the Annunciation, Mary conceived Jesus by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. As we read in Luke chapter 1, um, Mary had made a vow of virginity that Joseph had agreed to respect. She was already married to Joseph at this time. And um, so when Gabriel said to her, that she had been chosen to become the mother of God, she asked the question, how shall this happen since I do not know man? Which would not have made sense if, because she was already married, it wouldn't have made sense if she had not already made a vow of virginity. The question wouldn't have made sense. And so Gabriel answers by saying, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born shall be called the Son of God. So that, that whole image of overshadowing of the Holy Spirit is very important biblical image. Like it's called the Shekinah, the glory cloud. And if you read the Old Testament, how um, they were led by the glory cloud, um, which was a pillar of fire in the night and a pillar of cloud by day. So the cloud, also the transfiguration, the bright cloud overshadowed them is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But Our Lady is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit at the Annunciation and conceives Jesus. At Pentecost, Mary, we know from Acts chapter one, was present with the apostles at Pentecost, praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and because she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit, which she became at the Annunciation, uh, she draws the Holy Spirit to the whole church. So at Pentecost, he came first to her and from her, out to the whole body because because St. Louis de Montfort says that the Holy Spirit continues to act in the same way as he's, he's always conceived Jesus through Mary. He continues to conceive Jesus through Mary, but now he conceives Jesus in us, in the individual members of the body of Christ, which is what why we call Pentecost the birthday of the church, because the, the body of Christ is, is born at Pentecost in a certain sense. I mean, in another sense, um, you can go back to Calvary for that. So Mary is the capacity of God for the whole human race. And this is important to think about because without Mary, we have no capacity really to receive God. Like Jesus says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. You, you know, so no matter how hard we try, we can't um, really purify ourselves enough to be ready to receive the infinite divin divine God. And, and so Our Lady allows us to share by her motherly love for us, she allows us to share in her capacity. So when, by praying with the apostles in the Seneca, she established the foundation for all her subsequent apparitions throughout history. So we know, um, and we'll talk in future videos about some of her more famous apparitions, but every time she appears on the earth, our blessed mother, always appears with the same purpose, okay, which is to unite with us in prayer, that we may share in her immense capacity for the Holy Spirit. She's just coming to, to mother us into the kingdom of God. So praying with the apostles, let's say with the apostles, in the Seneca at Jerusalem, our blessed mother drew the Holy Spirit down on the whole church, and she continues to unite with us in adoring her son in the Eucharist. And if you, when you're going in to adore Jesus in the Eucharist or when you're going to receive him in Holy Communion, unite yourself with our Blessed Mother and you'll find that, that you have a much greater power of influence through that Holy Communion or through that adoration. Um, through this consecration to our Blessed Mother, she allows us to share in her immense capacity for her spouse, the Holy Spirit, and she encourages us to follow Jesus through the sufferings of this life to eternal glory in the kingdom of our Father. So this is all about a gift. It's not about, um, 
you know, some people think, oh, well, you know, if I do this consecration, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to like start suffering a whole lot more? And what St. Louis de Montfort says, although God may send you crosses, if you're united with our blessed mother Mary, there will be a sweetness to them that, that will make them easier to bear. And God never tries us beyond our capacity. St. Paul tells us that. So we just have to, we have to trust, like Jesus said to St. Faustina, that we should often pray, Jesus, I trust in you, that it's a gift that Jesus is giving us, his own mother, to be our mother. So let's take advantage of that gift. Okay, thank you very much, and happy Pentecost to all of you.